To fully explore the larger media playground, we need to look beyond digital gaming's technical aspects and consider the human faces of gaming. The attractions of this interactive playground validate digital gaming status as one of today's most powerful social media. In this video, we'll explore some trends and issues with digital gaming, consider the economics of digital gaming, and evaluate the role of digital gaming in a democratic society. Virtual communities often crop up around online video games and fantasy sports leagues. Indeed, players may get to know one another through games without ever meeting in person, interacting with each other in pickup groups, temporary teams assembled by a matchmaking program integrated into the game, or in a guild or clan of mostly experienced players. Players communicate in two forms of in-game chat, voice and text. Chat allows players to socialize and coordinate missions within a guild or clan. These methods of communicating with fellow players, who may or may not know each other outside the game, create a sense of community around the game's story. Some players have formed lasting friendships or romantic relationships through gameplay. Communities also form outside games, through websites and even face-to-face -face events dedicated to digital gaming in its many forms. This is similar to when online and in-person groups form to discuss other mass media, such as movies, TV shows, and books. These communities of play fit into three categories. The first is collective intelligence, user-generated advice and tips related to gameplay that's posted online. I have visited the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic wiki for the Gameloft game for information on new characters and quests. Gaming sites and blogs are among the most popular external communities for gamers, including IGN, GameSpot, and Kotaku. There are also conventions and expos, gatherings where game enthusiasts come together to test out new games, play games in competition, and meet video game developers. One of the most significant is the Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3, held annually in Los Angeles. As games in their communities have grown more elaborate and alluring, many players have spent an increasing amount of time immersed in them, a situation that can feed addictive behavior in some people. Some games involve a player's entire body in gameplay. The Nintendo Wii system successfully harnessed user-friendly motion control technology in handheld controllers and for some games, a balance board to open up gaming to non-traditional players. Microsoft's Kinect system uses sensor cameras and microphones to translate a player's movements and commands into actions by on-screen avatars. Virtual reality gaming involves transporting players to new worlds without leaving their homes, using various combinations of special goggles, helmets, vests, and gloves embedded with visual and audio functions, haptic feedback capabilities, and sensors. VR devices include the Oculus Rift, pictured here, and Sony PlayStation VR. Enhanced reality games like Pokemon Go take immersion in a different direction, moving the gaming experience out of living rooms and arcades and into the world. Using smartphone screens to reveal hidden characters and rewards, the game requires players to walk around outside to catch Pokemon. Immersive games are also being used in workforce training, in military recruiting, for social causes, in classrooms, and as part of multimedia journalism. Developments like these continue to make games an ever larger part of our media experiences, even for people who may not consider themselves avid gamers. Addiction to digital gaming, sometimes called internet gaming disorder, is described in the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5, which is used by mental health professionals to diagnose mental disorders. There was not sufficient evidence to determine how to classify IGD when the DSM-5 was published in 2013, which leads some critics to consider the definition too vague. Nonetheless, most experts agree IGD is a problem and gamers cross the line from hobbyist to addict when their physical and mental health is affected, experiencing depression, anxiety, and feelings of isolation. These addiction-related findings are not entirely surprising, given that many digital games are addictive by design. 
just as habit formation is a primary goal of virtually every commercial form of digital media, from newspapers to television to radio, cultivating obsessive play is the point of most games. From recognizing high scores to levels that gradually increase in difficulty, designers provide constant in-game incentives for obsessive play. Even your Farmville crops would start to die if you didn't, didn't visit daily. The Entertainment Software Association, the main trade association for the gaming industry, likes to point out that nearly half of game players are women and that more than three quarters of games sold are rated in the family and teen friendly categories. While these statements are true, they also mask a troubling aspect of some of the industry's most popular games, their violent and sexist imagery. Most games involving combat and weapons are intentionally violent. The most violent video games, rated M for mature, often belong to the first person shooter, dark fantasy or survival horror genres and cast players in sinister roles in which they earn points by killing and maiming their foes in horrendous ways. Whether violent video games lead to real world violence has been a hotly debated topic for years and we'll explore it a little further in a supplemental video. Another major concern is how women are portrayed in video games as damsels in distress, as rewards for successful male avatars, or as hypersexualized representations, even when they are the main character, like Lara Croft in the Tomb Raider series. Lara is a highly intelligent archaeologist, which you can tell from her sports bra and short shorts. An extreme example of a misogynistic game narrative is the Grand Theft Auto series, where a male character can earn health points by having sex with a prostitute. The character can then beat up or kill the prostitute to get his money back. Today, 64% of American households have someone at home who regularly plays video games, with 41% of gamers playing on a personal computer, 36% playing on smartphones, and 36% playing on dedicated game consoles. The entire U.S. video game market, including portable and console hardware and accessories, added up to $43.4 billion in 2018. Traditionally, the primary source of revenue for digital gaming was the sale of consoles and games, but the digital turn has altered the distribution relationship. There are three main pay models in the digital gaming industry. Boxed games are sold at retail stores, and that's the old standby, although many boxed games are now sold with offers of additional downloadable content. With a subscription model, gamers pay a monthly fee to play. At the height of its popularity, World of Warcraft earned more than $1 billion a year. Yet with so many free games available, the subscription model hasn't expanded widely. The free-to-play, or freemium, model is common with casual and online games. They are offered online or downloadable for free to reach a mass audience. The games make money by selling extras like power boosts or other bonuses or in-game subscriptions for upgraded play. Some games also make money through in-game advertising. While many big box retail stores like Walmart, Best Buy, and Target sell boxed video games, GameStop is the only remaining major video game store chain. The biggest challenge to gaming stores, regardless of size, is digital distribution. All three major consoles are Wi-Fi capable, and each has its own digital store. Using these platforms, customers can purchase and download games, get extra downloadable content, and buy other media, such as television shows and movies, as the consoles compete to be the sole entertainment center of people's living rooms. Several companies compete for the PC game download market, with Steam being the largest and carrying more than 15,000 games from a variety of game publishers. Apple's App Store and Google Play are the most ubiquitous digital game distributors, where users can download games for their mobile devices. Development, marketing, and licensing constitute the major expenditures in game publishing. The development budget pays for writers to create the concept and storyline of the game, artists to design characters and backgrounds, 
actors to voice characters, and programmers to turn everything into code. As costly as development can be, big game releases spend even more on marketing. The successful launch of a game involves online promotions, banner ads, magazine print ads, in-store displays, and television commercials. In many ways, the marketing blitz associated with introducing a new major franchise title, including cinematic television trailers, resembles the promotional campaigns surrounding the debut of a blockbuster movie. Independent game makers also deal with licensing. First, they have to pay royalties to the console manufacturers, that's Nintendo, Sony, or Microsoft, for the rights to distribute a game using their proprietary system, ranging from three to $10 per unit sold. Games may also license someone else's intellectual property, characters, stories, personalities, and music that require licensing agreements. In 2005, for instance, John Madden reportedly signed a $150 million deal with EA Sports that allowed the company to use his name and likeness for the following 10 years. We'll close this chapter on the role of digital gaming in a democratic society. While most view gaming as a simple leisure activity, it has sparked its share of controversy. Back in 1976, an arcade game called Death Race promoted the first public outcry over violence in digital gaming. The primitive graphics of the game depicted a blocky car running down stick fig figure gremlins that, if struck, turned into grave markers. Described as sick and morbid by the National Safety Council, Death Race inspired a 60 Minutes report on the potential psychological damage of playing video games. Since then, violent video games have prompted citizens groups and politicians to call for government regulation of digital game content. In 1993, after violence in Mortal Kombat and Night Trap attracted the attention of religious and educational organizations, a hearing was conducted to propose federal regulation of the gaming industry. In an effort to avoid government oversight, the industry turned to self-regulation and founded the Entertainment Software Ratings Board to institute a labeling system much like those for TVs and movies, designed to inform parents of sexual and violent content that might not be suitable for younger players. Ratings range from E for everyone, for games like Minecraft, to a handful of games rated AO for adults only 18 and up. Although many AO games, like Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, were later edited to receive an M for mature rating. Though 80% of retail outlets voluntarily choose to observe the ESRB guidelines and not sell M and AO rated games to minors, the ratings did not have the force of law. In 2005, a California tried to make it illegal to rent or sell an M rated video game to a minor, but the law was challenged by the industry and struck down by a lower court as unconstitutional. California petitioned the Supreme Court to hear the case, and in 2011's Brown v. Entertainment Merchants Association, digital games were officially granted First Amendment free speech protections. As Justice Antonin Scalia wrote, like the protected books, plays, and movies that preceded them, video games communicate ideas, and even social messages, through many familiar literary devices, such as characters, dialogue, plot, and music and through features distinctive to the medium, such as the player's interaction with the virtual world. While video game criticism has historically been focused on violence, complaints have arisen about portrayals of women and members of marginalized communities, both in games and in gaming culture. While most blockbuster games cater to and feature white males, mobile gaming has provided a new entry point for alternative voices.